Okay, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Office of Strategic Planning, I'd like to welcome everyone to meeting three of the Dogwood Elementary School uh, Capacity Relief Study. Um, our committee members are joining us. I hope you've had a chance to uh, get a little something to eat and drink. Um, and uh, I invite you to please uh, have a seat at your tables according to your respective badge colors, at the, uh, the blue table or the red table. Uh, take a moment to remind everyone we are live streaming this evening. So if you have a comment or a question, committee members, please raise your hand for the microphone uh, so that uh, our folks at home uh, can hear us and for the sake of the recording that we can pass a microphone to you and capture your comments. Um, our restrooms are right outside the uh, double doors here. And uh, of course, in the event of an emergency, fire alarm or what have you, uh, we'll all gather just outside the cafeteria uh, along that exit um, and uh, recon outside and uh, make sure we have everyone in attendance. Um, without further ado, uh, I invite uh, Mr. Matt Cropper, our, uh, our consultant, uh, leading this process. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Bricado. And thank you all for, uh, for coming back. You know, it's a bad night for traffic and, uh, and uh, the rain isn't, doesn't make anything easy, but I'm glad to see you guys here. So getting into the agenda tonight, um, we'd like to review some uh, information and the draft options that, uh, that uh, we left off with at the last meeting. We're going to have you guys work in some small groups to, uh, to, to do some uh, further evaluation of the options as it relates to the, to the considerations and the, uh, um, some of the objectives. And then we're going to have a discussion of some of that, in, that small group work. And then finally, the, the main objective tonight is to discuss and decide which options to take to the public information session, which is coming up in a in a few weeks. And so the real focus by the end of tonight's meeting is we'd like to have a set of options to take to the public that you guys feel comfortable sharing with, with the public in their draft form. So um, just a little bit of the, this is the uh, timeline you could see. Here we are in meeting three. Um, we have a public information session on February 27th. And then after that, we have one more meeting to finalize your recommendation. And then at that point, the committee's work is complete, and then we will be going to the board to present the recommendation on May 7th. And then after that, the board will have a, a public hearing to, to hear from the public. The public will be invited to come uh, talk uh, about their concerns or their thoughts and observations about the, the recommendation, and the board will vote in June. So, um, so I think we're, we're doing well. We're right on task and on target with where we, had, where we normally see a committee at this time and um, making good progress. I want to go over the objectives um, the, again and just to re recap some of this since we're, uh, since we're looking at selecting some options to take to the public. So the community-based conference of boundary study is tasked with meeting the following key objectives. To provide capacity relief to Dogwood Elementary School, to create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize capacity, and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. We have rules to follow rule, per Rule 1280 that's established by the board. Um, and I've gone over these a couple times at meetings with you, but I just wanted to re uh, repeat them again. And these are um, to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, Maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. The impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students. Minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned. Efficient capacity, uh, use of capacity in affected schools. Long-term enrollment and capacity trends in future capital plans. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools. And additional things to consider are using geographic features such as railroads, creeks, major highways, major roads, things like that. That's uh, based on the, some best practices that you see across the country. So we have a little bit of follow-up on with you. Um, you had asked at the last meeting some questions, and we've got some follow-up on that. So one of the questions is, what policies or procedures does BCPS have in place to ensure safe and efficient school transportation services? So um, the transportation services and guidelines are provided in BCS policy and rules 3410 
and 3420. So if you go to the BCS uh, webpage and just type the policy uh, 3410 or 3420, you should be able to get access to those pretty quickly. Um, the transportation operating procedures document is available on the website, like I said. And then BCPS evaluates and ensures that all bus routes and walk zones adhere to these policy and rules to provide safe and efficient transportation of students. And so you see we have provided you with the walk, walkout boundaries, the boundaries for the schools for, as it relates to students who could walk to school. And those have been evaluated by the Office of Transportation and, um, and, as, as it, and they have evaluated those as it relates to some of their policies and rules uh, as it relates to school transportation. A reminder about the program moves and state rated capacity adjustments. And um, this is uh, just a, a recap. We discussed this last meeting, but we just wanted to recap this. So some special edu education programs at Featherbed Lane Elementary will relocate in coordination with this capacity relief study to provide some additional space uh, for, this, for these schools. This movement will reduce enrollment and provide additional space and capacity at that school. And the calculations for all options include 15 fewer students at Featherbed Lane to reflect this movement of the program out of there. Um, and the calculations for all options includes an SRC, a state rated capacity increase, from 654 to 667 as a result of this program moving out of the building. And this reflects the conversion of special education classrooms to standard, edu standard uh, elementary classrooms. So that's what uh, the result of pulling that program out and relocating that program is an increase in the capacity that we, get to, that we can use to, um, as you evaluate options. We had uh, just a, so a screenshot that kind of shows you what it looks like now versus after the program moves. So uh, currently you can see Dogwood is at 111, about 112% utilization. Um, 73 students over their state rated capacity. Featherbed Lane is currently 49 seats or students below the state rated capacity at 92.5% utilization. After the program uh, adjustment occurs, um, of course, Dogwood doesn't change. It still stays at around 112. But for Featherbed Lane and, and pulling the 15 out, it, uh, they then have 77 available seats or uh, 77 students below the state rated capacity. And then that utilization of the school with that program adjustment is 88%. So you can see the two schools that we're, that we're working with, uh, that there is an imbalance in the utilization and that, and that moving some students from Dogwood to uh, Featherbed Lane will help balance out um, this utilization and provide some relief to Dogwood Elementary School. So it's a combination of program moves and boundary adjustments to accomplish that. Um, is there any questions before I, before I move ahead with some of that material that I covered um, just at the beginning of the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> so in our first meeting, uh, the principal for Featherbed was here, and she said that these numbers were not right. Like, she said that, the, that she was much more overcrowded than this. So are these numbers correct, or did, is something an adjustment going to be made with the numbers she said is actually at her school? Okay, so we are using data as of September 30, okay? And it's a September 30th enrollment. Um, as a school year matures or evolves, the enrollment of a school fluctuates. It goes up and it goes down because students are enrolling, students are withdrawing, and, uh, and that's a natural part of just the way schools are being fed. Um, so it's important to do a point in time analysis when we do this type of work and this planning work. It's best to use the uh, preliminary September 30 numbers as the basis for planning, knowing that enrollment between now and the end of the school year is going to go up, may go down, it's going to sort of fluctuate as students are enrolling withdrawing. So, but um, the, the best practice is to use that September 30th planning figure, the enrollment as of that date for this planning purposes. And it's very likely that when the next school year starts, it'll be a com comparable point in time. So the district uses that point in time to do uh, enrollment projections and a lot of other statistical analysis. So it's good to use that same point in time when we do our uh, redistricting, uh, our boundary change planning so that we're, we're focusing on that same point in time, knowing that 
that Featherbed Lane may have more students now, but by the end of the school year, they may have less students. And that's just sort of the natural way that enrollment changes through a school year. So, sh so shouldn't a boundary study be done for the time that you're looking at? So I'm just thinking the boundary study should have been started back in September 30th, if these numbers reflect now, but now we're doing a boundary study for now. And if the boundary study for now is we're looking at the students and where they are now, it's, it's going to be an overcrowded to overcrowded situation. Even though I understand these numbers back in September 30th, but the boundary study we're doing now is for the numbers that, at real time. So what you're saying is we're not doing a real time boundary study, we're doing a, what was happened to be back in September 30th boundary study? Because um, to me, it, it doesn't make sense. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's a good question, and um, it's, best, it's best to use a, the, the static point in time to, as a basis for our planning purposes. And that's, it's most common to have that be either sep late September, early October enrollment numbers. That's the, 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 what we're working with in terms of planning. The, if, if we um, used an enrollment file, say, as of today or as of a week ago, it's very possible that we may be working off of a higher number, planning number, and that we may be taking um, either not enough or too many students out of a school. Because the, as enrollment fluctuates, that number varies, the enrollment of a school. So it's best to use the same point in time, and, and that's why they're using the September 30th enrollment, because that's also what the district uses as a basis for um, some of their other studies and statistical analysis and things like that. So, it's, it syncs up a lot of the data that you're looking at, the projections, the enrollment, and then, and then next year when they evaluate this boundary uh, recommendation, they'll be evaluating it to September 32 to, as well to sort of see an apples to apples comparison. Right. So we don't take growth into consideration. It's kind of like if, you, if, if you're looking at a tree and you make a decision, if this tree doesn't grow, then I'm going to chop it down. But then... Six months later, the tree grows big, so you got to now change your plans because the tree grew. This is what's happening now. We looked at September 30th, and it said 667, but it, now it's now over 700. So I, 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 I don't see how planning for not the growth, like, like we're leaving a growth out. <laughs> and if, if you try to put more water into a cup that's already overflowed, it's just going to keep overflowing. But you want right. us to plan off of what it looked like back then when the cut was maybe a little bit half full, but now it's full, but we got to plan off that half full. Well, I, but, just, I don't know. So the, speaking on the cup, the cup of water or the bucket of water, um, what, you're, what, you, what you're thinking in the way that you're describing it is that there is only water being poured into the bucket and that enrollment is increasing. And that's, but that's not the only factor that occurs here. There's actually a hole in the bottom of the bucket too. And as students are coming in and that water's increasing, there's also a hole that students are coming out. So the, the water's also leaving the bucket and that enrollment's actually going down. So it fluctuates up and down. And sometimes the rate of water coming in, the students coming in, may, may make it increase. But by the time the school year ends, there's going to be water coming in the bucket and water coming out of the bucket, and then wherever that lands is, is undetermined. So, and that's why it's best to use the same point in time, and that's what's most common for school districts across the country to use that September 30th number because of that fluctuation in the water level of a, of a school. For, for Right. So with you saying that, I'm not seeing the fluctuation numbers here. Like the only thing I'm seeing that's being taken out is the special education numbers. Okay. The other fluctuations are not showing us what the hole at the bottom of the bucket is coming out. It's just saying that there is a hole. But the fluctuation, like her fluctuation, if I can remember, if we're saying 667 at September 30th, she said I'm well over, I'm, I'm over 700 right now. So that fluctuation went up. Okay. I, when does the fluctuation come down? Or so I could say, okay, well then, at this point in time of the school year, they're going to be sitting here, but then the fluctuation may happen again, which means it may go up again. So planning on the fluctuation is just us saying we hope this is going to happen or we 
think is going to happen when it doesn't seem to be happening as what the principal at Featherbed said. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's going to be moved out is the 15 students for uh, the special education, which can't be moved to Dogwood because they don't have that program. Right. So if we're talking about a third school <clears throat> that we're going to move this to, why, the third school is not even here to let us know what's happening over there. Mm -hmm. So it's like I went through these three options while we were out, and I'm like, the, the three options are good, but the three options are still saying that I'm taking a little bit over here and a little bit from over here, but we're still going to be overcrowded. Well, maybe what we do as a follow-up is we give you some... Uh, we follow up with you on some enrollment numbers, maybe if we could provide an enrollment figure for the buildings as of, uh, as of this point in time. So maybe we can provide that to you. And maybe I'll talk with the district about possibly giving you some historical enrollment numbers through time so you can kind of see how the numbers go up and down and fluctuate. I think that uh, the principals would, uh, would agree with me that enrollment is not... Uh, uh, easy target to, 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 to nail down because kids are enrolling and withdrawing on a daily basis. And it's, so it's always, the enrollment's always going to be rather kind of nebulous in terms of uh, fluctuating. But maybe as a follow-up to sort of better inform you, we'll give you some uh, point-in-time enrollment figures for the school so you can kind of see what it was at September 30th, what it is, uh, you know, what it maybe was at Christmas or something like that, and then now... So maybe a couple points in time so you can kind of see how it fluctuates and maybe we can pull something historically like maybe for last year so you can kind of see how it flows over a course of a school year just to kind of better understand how that variable and inform you. And it may, it may, it may inform you that if there's a lot of up and down, maybe you don't want to add as many students to Featherbed because so that they can absorb that high point of enrollment and then, you know, as opposed to being overcrowded, even if it may be a month or two during a school year. So we'll follow up with you on that and, and provide that as some, uh, some information at the, for the next meeting. It's a good, good question. Any other questions about uh, anything that we've discussed or anything before I, keep, uh, before I move, move through the presentation? So um, we have the same three draft options that, are being share, uh, that were shared with you at meeting two or being shared with you tonight. As you recall, um, you guys broke into s uh, some small groups and really started diving into the maps. And uh, it was your first time looking at the maps, so you were, a lot of it was in understanding how the maps were shaped and which areas are being moved. And uh, as a result of that last meeting, there were no new options created or no, no areas you had said, move this area in and move this area out. But, um, but uh, you, did, you did indicate that you wanted to take a better look at the, the numbers and data, and there could possibly be additional options created as to, at tonight's meeting, or, um, or maybe it options ruled out. But uh, one of the things to remind you is that we've got the same maps that we brought in meeting two or shared with you tonight. If you don't have uh, your binder with you, we do have some extra copies that we can provide to you of meeting two materials. If you do need that, um, um, either Melissa or Mike in the back, you can raise your hand and they'll, they'll help you uh, get materials. I think every, I see most people have their binders. Remember that everything is considered draft, even through this process, even when we go to the public information session in a couple weeks, everything is going to be draft. So nothing is set in stone, everything is still subject to change based on your continual review of the, of the options, and new options can and will be creating, created. So the focus isn't to pick the best solution or the best draft option that you want to recommend yet, but to openly explore the options to present to the public for feedback. So thinking about which options do we want to take to the public to get to share with them and, and get their reaction and their response to and see what they say uh, if, if there's anything that they're providing and input that you may not have uh, seen yet or thought of. Going through um, the options, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, recap, the advantages and limitations that I had identified with the options. And uh, I've got a couple, some a little bit more information based on committee discussions as well. So uh, option one, um, before I get into the, what I have on, this, on the slide, I'll talk a little bit about the stuff that I found that Zorn and myself found when we were doing some research today, is we went and drove, uh, drove through the area 
you see option one pulls east of Rolling, Rolling Road, and in, in uh, this option, it doesn't every single option. And another, the difference between the options is really up in this area in the top. This is an apartment complex. Um, and so what we're doing is we're pulling this top northernmost part of this apartment complex into Featherbed Lane. And then also this area right here that's currently in, in uh, Featherbed goes to Dogwood. So it's kind of a two-way shift to, to make that happen. Uh, committee members had said last meeting that this, I think it's Cumberland Road that comes in uh, right over here. And um, that it looks on paper like it's a road that can drive in. So you could think a bus may come in here, pick up these kids, and then roll into here and pick up these students and take them to Featherbed. But this road is actually closed. And I, we did validate that. I went and looked at it, and it's, you know, it's, it's road closed sign and things like that. And I was evaluating that to see how would this area get picked up. And uh, one of the things I noticed, and I would probably call this a limitation to this option, is that what they would, there's 35 kids in this planning block. So what a bus would have to do is it would probably come in on Hither Green. And this is a part of the apartment complex is right here already going to Featherbed. So they would come down Hither Green. They would pick up students on, in these apartment uh, buildings. And then they, they'd have to drive in through the Dogwood area and then go up to get to this area and then drive back out and out Hither Green to get back out. So this is one that's kind of, it, although this looks like it's connected to all of this other area, it's actually sort of a disconnect from the rest of the community that goes to Featherbed in, um, in this region. So that was an observation that I had. And you know I would encourage you guys to go up there and check it out and get your own opinion of that. Um, but that's something that I had a, we had observed when we were looking at it further today. Some of the, advan the advantage of this option is that it does use rolling road as a dividing line. I think you as committee members have indicated that as a positive thing. It's a major road um, that, uh, that divides, that sort of separates that area from going to Featherbed in this option. Um, some of the limitations that it provides the least relief of all options. It does impact the most students because it's, we're, we're pulling students out of Dogwood to Featherbed, but this also sends some students from Featherbed to Dogwood, which other options do not do, not do that. Um, and then um, and any shift results in a split from elementary to middle, so that's actually a limitation on all of our, all of our options because the current boundary line between Dogwood and Featherbed is also, shares the same line for middle school uh, zones. And so any adjustment that we move is going to create a split in the, from elementary to middle school because um, this area currently, all of Dogwood goes to one middle school and then this, all of Featherbed goes to another. And pulling this in, you would have this part of Dogwood would go to a different middle school. Um, this part of uh, Featherbed, I'm sorry, would be split and this part of Featherbed would then go to this middle school still, and the remainder of Featherbed would go to the school that they're zoned to. Um, so that's something that exists in all the options. We're only looking at elementaries here, and that's really nothing that we can do to avoid that um, as you look at boundary adjustments. Option two is the same uh, rolling road like I mentioned. Um, this does have, this area in the north that I was talking about does not move out, so that all stays intact. And instead, this bottom right corner of the, of a few more um, apartments that are contiguous to the other apartments are actually pulled into Featherbed Lane to, in, in this particular option to give them some relief. Um, this is the second best balance of utilization among all three options, and this option impacts the fewest number of students. Um, so, um, and then again, the limitations is that we are splitting apartment, uh, uh, more apartments. This apartment complex is divided between two schools, but it currently is, it's currently divided between two schools. So we're not creating any uh, new issues. We're just uh, assigning some other communities that are already, that are adjacent to, that are already going to Featherbed, adjacent to it in this scenario, to more of them going to Featherbed. And again, you have the middle school split um, issue that we have identified. In the third option, 
the same thing, uh, the rolling road uh, piece is, is in a feather bed in that option, as, as was option one and two. And the difference is in this option, instead of the bottom, bottom southeastern corner of this area, that's going to Dogwood, moving that out. Another uh, two bl planning blocks um, east of Hither Green, um, as you drive in, would be assigned to Featherbed in this scenario. This, this option poses uh, the best balance of utilization among all three scenarios, um, and it impacts the second fewest number of students. Um, and some of the limitations are the, the same ones that I had mentioned in, in the other two scenarios, a middle school split and then a further sp uh, split of some of the apartments to a different school. Does anybody have any other thoughts about uh, they want to contribute or anything they want to add to any of the three options that you guys, um, that you guys have a thought about or anything else that you wanted to comment on? Hello. Okay. I just want to say for the record that my dogwood kids are already split between two middle schools. They're already split between two middle schools. So any of the options okay. would not be a great inconvenience because there's still a pocket of kids that go to Woodlawn Middle School and okay. still a very large percentage that go to um, Windsor Mill, but it's already split now based off of our current boundaries. Okay, and I, is, I wonder, is Woodlawn this direction further west? I can't see the pin. Um, so here's Dogwood, so this is like Ridge Road uh, com coming out here. Mm -hmm. I believe that's uh, Dogwood Road maybe, or um, I believe that this area out here is the area that, that is split potentially, um, but but so, but what you're, but what you're saying is that there is already a, a small split that exists, and so if there's a this this does, there's a split exists that's not anything new for Dogwood Elementary School. No. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other comments? All right. So we're going to give you guys, we're going to do a couple of exercises tonight. Um, we want to perform two exercises to evaluate the draft options. Uh, the first one's going to give you a little bit, uh, make you evaluate these as it relates to the criteria, those, those, those Rule 1280. And then the, the second exercise is going to be one that actually helps to uh, establish consensus on which options to take to the public. So um, as you're doing this next one, um, as you're doing this next exercise, Think about um, what this may yield and what, what the results of this may be and if there may be an option or a modification to an option that you want to consider. And we can certainly consider changes to the option, any option, or creating a new option um, based on whatever you guys uh, uh, come up with and what you discussed at, this, at tonight's, uh, tonight's meeting. What we're going to do here, this is called the option evaluation exercise. And uh, you see here that you have a large plot of this at your table. And these are the boundary study considerations as per Rule 1280 that I talked about. And um, you have a series of stickers as well that accompany the, 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 um, the plot. So what we want you to do is work as a group, and we'll have you guys work in your two groups. And we want you to, using the stickers provided, place a colored sticker to rate each option by the consideration using the following key. So red would be poor. So if you feel like this option poorly adheres to this element of the considerations, you'd put a red sticker. If, it's, if you think it is fair, it would be yellow. And if you think it does a good job of adhering to the considerations, you'd put a green sticker in one of these. So you'd start looking at this first one. And option one, okay, is does it make efficient use of capacity in schools? You guys as a group would decide red, green, or blue, red, green, or uh, yellow on that in that cell. You would go through each option and down the list, and then we and then that may that may inform you that okay if if we're looking at if there's red on these couple considerations maybe what option what could we make adjustment could we make to a scenario that may bring it to a yellow or possibly a green sticker as opposed to a red sticker. 
So um, does you guys have any questions about that exercise? So we have, how many people do we have? We have four at one and three at another? Okay, so we're good with our tables. So you guys can work in your group and then this, this group in the back works. And we'll let you guys have some time to do this and then when you're ready, we'll uh, regroup and talk about your findings. And um, just let us know if you have any questions as you go, okay?
All right, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, regroup, and uh, I'm hearing lots of good conversations around the table. You guys are really studying the maps and talking about the options and the considerations, so it's really good, constructive uh, conversation going on, and I see stickers on, the, on your exercise. So let's go ahead and have, um, have us report out. Maybe we'll start with this back group, and then... Uh, if you guys want to go first, and you can kind of tell us your thoughts and uh, some of your conversations and the, so that everybody can benefit and uh, see what you have to say. Okay, so first off, nobody really likes option one. <laughs> All right. Um, but the efficient use of capacity in effective schools, we felt, was better in option two. Um, and... Uh, maintaining the, con the continuity of neighborhoods we found was better for option two. Option, option three gave some, some good, um, it was some good decisions, but we felt it was better for option two. Um, maintaining or increasing the, the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region, we felt like it, it really, that it really didn't speak to exactly what we're doing with the boundary study, so we, you know, we gave them all we said it, it, it'll be good for all of them. The impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students we felt was better for option two, um, but we also discussed the fact of the that one street that was blocked off. That you know, if that could, if that ever was opened up, that would open up a possibility for school buses to get back there, and it would it would probably um, put an impact on all of the options if a bus can get back there according to, you know, what students can go to which school and and so forth and so on. So, you know, we, we were like, you know, we don't know why it was blocked off or if it was legally blocked off or illegally, we, we, we don't know. But if there's a possibility that that could get opened up one day, option one, two, and three would change because now you have a street that a school bus can get down and pick up students. So it would, you know, benefit both um, schools. Uh, let's see what else. Um, Long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future capital plans. Um, we put it fair for all of them because it, do, it doesn't seem like, um, I guess when you're saying capital plans, what, what do you mean by capital plans? Because I know that there is no, um, like you can't build on feather bed anymore. We talked about that. We don't know how much you could build on dogwood. So future capital plans on building the schools or future capital plans on developments in the area? It's, I think it relates to the school, future capital plans as it relates to schools. And remember, this is a consideration that the BCPS uses across the county. So that applies to other parts. That The future cap capital plans is really not part of what we're looking at. Right. So it would really be uh, pertinent, the long-term enrollment and capacity trends right. would really be the the point that you're focused on, which you alluded to. Right, so yeah, we kept it fair for that. And the continuity of feeder patterns um, on whether or not the kids will be going to what, which middle school didn't really factor in our decision, so we just made that fair also. Okay, any other, dis any other discussions or anything that you guys had, um, had asked about or anything like that, any, anything else you want to bring up, any side, side discussions you guys were having as you were looking at it? Or any other, any other thoughts on uh, option adjustments or maybe something that may drive a change? As we were looking at the options, we noticed that um, Rolling Road is not really the cutoff. Because in every option, there is spillage over, feather bed spilling over Rolling Road. So that's not really the cutoff. I mean, it's a crossroad street, but it's not the cutoff for this boundary study. So as we were looking at that, we were like, why is it that on Rolling Road, in every option, feather bed spills over, but dogwood doesn't? Right. So it's, it doesn't look like it's, it's an actual um, divider. Right. Yeah, because you're right, because the current feather bed line does spill over west of Rolling Road, but then on the south, dogwood comes over across Rolling Road, too. So I think what, the, what we were identifying is that it Which limits, was that? It limits dogwood. Dogwood wouldn't, uh, for e any option, either any, all three options, we cut that rolling road, east of rolling road from dogwood, keep that in feather bed. So I guess you look, you know, you bring up a good point. 
Featherbed's crossing roller, rolling road up in the further north, but currently Dogwood does as well. It crosses in the other, opposite direction. So what this option does is it just further reduces the number of crossover on rolling road. Dogwood wouldn't cross rolling road, but Featherbed still would. Right. Um, so, but that's a, you know, that's a good observation, certainly a good point that, that exists with the current boundaries. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. I appreciate that. It was good, good information. Well, let's let's hear from this group. What you guys are, um, uh, what you guys discussed. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. So we. Um, had some similar findings to what the first group did. Um, we overall liked option one the least for several reasons. Um, we do not feel like it's an efficient use of capacity. We're concerned about too many students being rerouted to Featherbed um, and that we don't want to exacerbate a problem there. So we like that option the least in that category. Um, we felt like all the options sort of maintain the continuity of the neighborhood. So that that almost wasn't a factor in our decision making. Um, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools. The only numbers we really got, um, they were all the same. So unless we're gonna look deeper at like ELL populations or something like that, which we can do, um, this doesn't seem to be a big factor in which option we're gonna pick. Um, impact of transportation and pedestrian pat uh, patterns. Again, we're not a big fan of option one, but we do feel like um, option two um, was, was a solid choice in that respect because if you look back at the map, it's just those two planning blocks out of the apartment section. It's already adjacent to feather bed, so it doesn't feel like a big disruption um, as far as um, you know, continuity of, of neighborhoods or, or uh, the patterns, I guess. You would already have buses going right by there and that kind of thing. Um, and option three is okay in that respect, but we definitely preferred option two. Um, the next category, long-term enrollment and um, capacity trends. Again, kind of back to the same issue. We're very hesitant to overload Featherbed. We think being very conservative in moving students over um, is the best plan. So for that reason, also, we like option two, and we even talked about maybe coming up with an option, although we didn't have time to do it, where we move even fewer students, just kind of to, just to see what that looks like. Um, we do want to alleviate the overcrowding, but at, at Dogwood, um, but we, speaking with the principal of Dogwood, we know that there are some special permissions there now that are going to be um, leaving over the next couple years, um, and we know that uh, feather bed seems to be growing. Um, I want to come back to that idea in a minute. Um, so we just really want to be conservative with how many students we move at this time. Um, continuity of feeder patterns, it seems like this is also not a factor between the options because it's all kind of the same. We're always, in each situation, will have the same effects on feeder patterns. So overall, our group definitely liked option two the best. Um, the, the one thing I did want to come back to is that, um, and I think Darnell is that, um, brought this up earlier, and we just wanted to touch on this because it came up in our discussion. Um, it seems like, I understand the bucket analogy with population, you know, coming in and leaving over the course of a year, and so you have inflow and outflow. But it's, it seems like what the community feels or is telling us is that maybe over time, even though there's inflow and outflow, maybe there's growth. So if we could see those numbers and see if indeed over time the feather bed population is increasing, um, that would just be a little more data to back up our idea that we don't want to overload feather bed because both at this moment in time, they're overcrowded according to the principle, but in the big picture, they're also growing. You know, the, the long-term data would be interesting. Um, did we have anything else to say? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that's, you know, really good, really good discussion. I'm really, 
Uh, proud of you guys for uh, diving into this and just studying it almost road by road. So it's a very good, very good stuff. Um, so um, we are at the point where what we'd like to do is uh, look at determining which options we want to take to the public for the public information session. Keep in mind that um, everything's draft and there's still time after that to make to, for you guys to finalize a decision and a recommendation. Um, it's most common, and when we do these studies uh, across the country and also the studies that we've done for BCPS, um, it's most common for, for committees to have about three, maybe no more than five options that they take to the public, about three to five. I don't know if we have taken two, or we certainly don't want to take one option. We, what we want to do is, as a committee, you want to bring options together to, forward to the, to the public to get some of their input. They may provide input that you haven't thought about, and some other things that, that you may not have considered that could be useful. Even if you feel like an option is un, a, a non-starter, there may be something that you that some benefit to have getting some feedback on on an option if it's even if it's one that you don't necessarily like. So with that said, it's not it's 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 up to you as a committee how you want to proceed and what how, what options you want to take to the public. But it's it's not um, what I'm saying is don't feel like you have to remove an option tonight. If you guys feel as a group you want to take all three options to the public and get some input and then finalize your recommendation at the last meeting, you can do that. If, if it, I'd say that if there's a consensus among, among the group, if you guys are unanimous in the, in the thought of taking whatever set of options, that's what we determine to do. If one committee member feels differently, then I think it'd probably be best for you guys to take all, th all three to the public to get some input and continue to get more, more feedback. Um, do you guys have any thoughts? Uh, what we want to do is we want to have a discussion before we have a, a more formal vote on which ones to take to the public. So what my thoughts are is that we have a discussion as a group and try to see if there's consensus among the group through a discussion. And then once we, once we establish that and understand where we all land as a group, then we will have a, a use what we call active vote, is a vote, voting pr procedure, just to make, make it uh, solidified in the record so we can go back to this in a couple of years and say, what, how did the committee vote on this particular uh, issue or this consideration? So what are your thoughts about which options you want to take to the public? Do you guys have any comments? As a, in, anybody have any feelings or thoughts? Yes, sir. Um, I think that in the, um, in the spirit of um, transparency and neutrality, we take all three because we got to give them, we, 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 you can't leave an option out from the community um, when you're asking for their feedback. Right, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I agree. I think we should take all three and or. I kind of want to hear if anybody thinks it's a good idea to draft up another option that moves fewer students. So I just wanted to see what, what you your group might think of that or if you think that's crazy <laughs> do you have do you have something in mind maybe a scenario that you guys didn't have time and, and if I give you a, if I give you I'd be willing to look at it I made some notes before I came today but um, you want me to give you like 20 minutes to yeah, work as a big group that? and you guys can look I mean yes certainly we have time we have all the way until eight eight o'clock in this process and so we can give you guys like maybe uh, 20 minutes that so you can like, work as a group and think about uh, what your thoughts are and see what how the group feels. I'm interested in that option just to see if anybody is yeah. amenable to another to a modified. People option. are nodding. Let's do that. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you guys have say 20 minutes or so and work through some of your thoughts with the whole group, and you guys can work as an entire group, and then we'll uh, we'll regroup once you guys talk. Okay, Thanks. that works.
um, I think you guys have uh, formulated another draft as you guys talked. Um, maybe what we could do is if, if you guys could uh, bring that map up to the front here so the whole, the whole group could see it and also we could have so the public can see what you guys were, um, have, have put together here. And let's get you a microphone, which is coming over here. Let's wait till we get a microphone on you so we can uh, hear you. Okay, so as a big group, we came up with one more option that we think would be interesting to present to the community. Um, and that option is <laughs> ignoring this line that we drew on the map here. So. Um, Returning back to the original map where this bottom section is still um, dogwood, flows into dogwood, thank you. Um, but instead, taking planning block, blocks 108, 111, and 112 and routing those students to feather bed, which routes basically the same number. It's, it's about 70, um, that direction. So it doesn't really decrease that number much, but it does give us another point to um, have more input from the community on some different ideas and just kind of presents another option, which we thought was an important thing to do since although we agreed to present all the options, none of us were really big fans of option one. So again, we still think we want to present all the options, but we like having a fourth to fill it out to get more feedback. Okay, yeah, and I could see the positives of this and actually yeah. uh, like the rolling road divider that exists in all three options right right and it's somewhat arbitrary because the students are crossing rolling road now as your group pointed out so you know it's not making a situation worse in that right. respect um, it also this is community continuity still you know you still have buses going nearby for that school so it doesn't seem to break any of those criteria that we um, that we work to to hold true okay. to. So I think that's a very good a very good option you came up with, and so what we'll do is we'll call that option four. Okay. So that'll be option four that we will um, bring uh, uh, formulate numbers and put it included in all of our materials. Um, and you guys want to have any other comments? Anybody else want to talk about that or any other discussions you guys had when you broke up in another little side side uh, uh, meeting? Okay. All right. So. Um, so let's let's re revisit uh, the discussion about options for the public. I think that does this change anybody's perspective on taking uh, the the original three and then one? Does anybody have any different thoughts? Because I know that when we before we broke into the small group, you guys had decided it's good to take the first three. Now you've built a fourth option, which is good. Do you want to take, uh, as a group, do you feel that we should take all four scenarios to the public and then get some feedback? Um, does, anybody, uh, does anybody have any opposition to doing that as a group? Anybody? Okay. So it sounds like we have, the group has some, some consensus among that and taking four scenarios to the public to get some input. And, um, and I think that certainly is a good... Um, a good plan for you to take some some options and get the public's input and uh, their perspectives on all four and then you guys can 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 leverage that information to um, to determine which one you want to recommend at the next follow-up meeting so we have a uh, an active vote here um, that we are going to work through I wonder if we should rename that to say all scenarios in plus option four so that we can include uh, that option four is included. Yes, so all scenarios presented at tonight's meeting plus option four should be brought to the public information session, okay? So we have these, uh, everybody has your little active vote things? So, um, so yes, A is yes, B is no, and what you guys do is when you, when you determine uh, you're ready to vote. You basically vote yes or no to this question. All scenarios presented at tonight's meeting plus option four should be brought to the public information session. So you can go ahead and vote uh, yes or no. And everybody has voted. Okay, so the votes are in. And we have 100%. <laughs> 
have voted yes to bring all four to the, to the public information session. So, that's, so we do have a unanimous uh, decision on that. So, um, so we will be taking all four of these. We'll go ahead and put an option four map together in materials. And uh, talking a little bit about the public information session, that's going to be February 27th at, at right here at this exact place. It's going to be, uh, we're going to put about two to three copies of these maps up uh, and spread them out. So probably have a set in this corner and a set in the back wall and maybe a set over there so that the public doesn't bottleneck at maps and there'll be copies of the maps. There'll be, uh, we'll have the current boundaries and all, all four options at each station. And then it's going to be kind of a gallery walk format. So we'll probably have a setup like this where the public can, can listen to a presentation and understand the process and an overview of all the work that you've done up to date, and then an invitation for them to look at the maps. And then you as committee members are going to be standing around the maps and just dividing uh, and looking where people may be clustered and looking at maps and just helping them to answer questions and going up to them and say, do you have any questions about the maps or anything we can help? You know, you'll come to me certainly if there's anything hard you feel like you can't, uh, don't know the answer to, always come to me and answer, and I'll be happy to help answer the tough ones if there's somebody that's angry and things like that, you don't need to, to deal with that. I can take care of that. Um, and, but most important, what we'll do at this is we're also going to have a survey that accompanies the, the, the public information session. And so we're going to invite the public to participate in an online survey. And that's going to enable people who couldn't make it to the, to the meeting at that night to participate as well. So when you're talking to people around the maps and, and, and hearing their concerns, Tell them that, you know, it's good, that you, it's good for them to express their thoughts to you guys as a committee, but make sure you remind them to put their input into the survey so that every, so that every committee member who may not have been there having that discussion one-on-one -on -one can benefit from that, from that discussion. And the public as, and myself can also hear what everybody is saying. So the most important thing is to get them to participate in the survey uh, to accompany that public information session. And I'll, I'll explain that at the presentation. Um, the meeting time for this public information session will be 7.30 to 8.30 p.m., so it's one hour, and um, we're going to ask you if you could arrive at 7 p.m. so you can kind of get a feel for the layout and see where, how things are laid out. If you could get here at 7, that would be great. Uh, a reminder, we will not have dinner provided at that, at that particular next meeting, so, uh, so if, you're, um, if you're hungry, uh, please get something to eat before you get here because we won't have anything for, uh, in terms of uh, dinner. And then our next committee meeting, just mark your calendars, will be March 20th. So we'll have the February 27th. And then we have a decent break after that, all the way up to uh, March 20th is when your final committee meeting will be. And that's the meeting where you guys will finalize your recommendations. So February 27th, uh, in a couple of weeks. Anybody have any questions about that or any, uh, any other comments or questions before we let you go home? Okay, well, thank you very much. Really good meeting, and we'll see you at the public information session in a couple of weeks.